So I uh, chose this topic because many a times we get to see the discs which are actually doubtful. Like patient is completely alright but then suddenly we dilate the patient and what we see is a disc which is suspicious and then we start thinking whether we should start the treatment or not. So uh, glaucoma is the leading cause of blindness we understand. So it is very very important to as a, a basic thing like history and clinical examination. So many a times we tend to forget the risk factors. So whenever we see these kind of thing, we should actually, especially for residents, we should note down all the risk factors like besides elevated intraocular pressure, which is the most important risk factor. We also should check the dilate fluctuation. What is the fluctuation of intraocular pressure since morning till night? And not only this, suppose there is a family history of glaucoma, there is a refractive error, especially myopic refractive error, or if there is a disc hemorrhage, these all are factors we should note down. Now, whenever we have glaucoma suspect, what we actually suspect is whenever we see a elevated intraocular pressure. Now, what is happening many a times, what we see that a patient who has been subjected to NCT, and a reading of 24 or 25 and then he is put on anti-glaucoma medication. So it is very important for us to realize that NCT is very good diagnostic uh, modality for screening our patient because it is not possible to do applination in all the patient. But once we have elevated intraocular pressure, please don't forget to do applination and not just once, at least tries to confirm your diagnosis before going on to starting your treatment. Then it is important also to do a pachymetry for such patients. Suppose the patient is having thicker cornea. If the cornea is thicker, the intraocular pressure reading would be higher. So do there and then and then decide whether to start the treatment or not. Now suspicious disc, as we all see many a times, it definitely is seen in glaucoma suspect and sometimes something abnormal in the visual field examination. Now another important thing which we all tend to miss several times is gonioscopy because we understand that half of our glaucoma patients are narrow angle glaucoma. So gonioscopy is must for glaucoma diagnosis or any of the combination of these factors. Now when we see suspicious disc, we all know that about cup disc ratio and many things but certain things are very very important which I would like to emphasize is any deviation in isn't rule. If the inferior rim is thinner then automatically our bell should start ringing that yes there is some problem. Not only the thinner rim but if there is any defect, any abnormality in the inferior margin of the, in the inner margin of the disc. Like here. Now if we see a small subtle area notch here, then definitely there is a problem. So we should not miss this and for this a dilated disc examination is must. So any changes in the inner margin of the cup is very very important to suspect a glaucoma diagnosis. Now if we don't dilate, we definitely will miss this kind of disc hemorrhage. Here we can see a disc hemorrhage. Now also bearing of circumlinear vessel. Suppose you are seeing a patient who has a gap between this circumlinear vessel. We can see this is a circumlinear vessel which should follow the disc contour. But if it is not following the cup contour, that means it has receded. That means this patient might be a glaucoma suspect. Moreover, suppose you are doing serial disc photographs for these patients and if you see that this distance is increasing, then again it is a short, short sign of progression and you should note down this particular finding. Now in this patient also, we can see there is a bearing, a bearing of circumlinear vessel which should never be missed. Now this is another disc hemorrhage. Another thing I wanted to emphasize is whenever we have a disc like this where pallor is more than cupping, we should be very very careful that if pallor is more then definitely it is a neurological cupping and we should go for imaging. So now uh, we would be coming to American Academy of Ophthalmology algorithm for patients who are primary open angle glaucoma suspect. So whenever we see a suspicious disc like this and the pressures are normal. So as I said, we must look uh, these patients and uh, as an NTG suspect. 
and if pressure is 28 or more on application then definitely we need to treat these patients now the patients who are in between 22 to 26 we should not jump to start treatment immediately patient will never become blind in a day or two in the, in the meantime we can always investigate such patients so we should do a visual field examination if it is normal and there are no risk factors we can simply follow up these patients there is no rush to start treatment but if there is a visual field defect like this or three or more risk factors are present with a IOP which is in between like 22 to 26 millimeter of mercury then obviously we should treat these patients now coming to individuals who are NTG suspect where intraocular pressure is less than 22 but we are suspecting because of disc examination so whenever we, we have this kind of patient we should do a dialer variation and if we find that in dialer there is a rise in intraocular pressure or there is a higher intraocular pressure then we must treat these patients as open angle glaucoma patients but in patients in whom dialer fluctuation is not there then we must subject these individuals to visual field examination if we have they have normal visual field then we can go for imaging the role of imaging is very limited in glaucoma diagnostic but imaging has definite role in progression of glaucoma so if imaging is abnormal suppose you get rnfl defects on imaging then you need to follow these patients very closely with serial disc examinations, visual field examinations and intraocular pressure examination. Now if the imaging is also normal with normal visual field then definitely it is a physiological curve. You do not need to treat these patients. Now another thing can be there if there is abnormal visual field if it is like this then first of all rule out all the mimickers you might be seeing a optic disc pit like this or a morning glory syndrome like this or you might be seeing a large coloboma which is involving the disc so once you rule out because they can also produce visual field defects so once you can rule out all these mimickers and still there is a problem then definitely you are going to treat these normal tension glaucoma patients now coming to another very very important condition which we tend to get very frequently in our scenario our primary angle closure suspect so whenever we have these kind of suspect what is actually suspicious is gonioscopic examination so what we get occludable angle that means we are just unable to see the trabecular meshwork on gonioscopic examination so whenever it is there all the occludable angle doesn't need treatment we should be very clear about this if we have signs of intermittent closure like this suppose you have these peripheral anterior sinicures like this or you are having patchy pigmentation in on the gonioscopic examination or you are having you see the pupil and you see pupillary rough atrophy any of these signs are present that means there are subtle signs which are indicating that there is a subacute angle closure which is happening in this particular patient then definitely we should go yak iridotomy in such patients another thing is once the angle deepens now once the angle has opened up we treat these patients as primary open angle glaucoma patients now if the angle doesn't deepen so you are sure about signs of intermittent closure you have done a yag me, but angle hasn't deepened then that means the pathology is somewhere else so you need to see the double hump sign of plateau iris syndrome and if it is there on the gonioscopic examination or you can also see very clearly on anterior segment OCT now many of us are having anterior segment OCT so you can see plateau iris and in that case you don't uh, yeah PI is not at all required laser iridoplasty in the uh, is the answer in such individuals now if there are no signs of angle closure angles are occludable but they are opening up you need not to do iridotomy so all patients of occludable angle don't need laser iridotomy 
Now coming to decision making regarding therapy. Once we are sure about our diagnosis, we know now we need to start treatment in these individuals. So first and foremost thing what we need to realize is we need to establish a target intraocular pressure. So any patient, this is an uh, algorithm which is very easy to remember. Now if any patient who is early glaucoma, that means mean deviation is less than 6 decibels, the intraocular pressure should be in higher teens. So it can be around 18 millimeters of mercury. Moderate glaucoma, that means deviation is 12 decibel. So intraocular pressure should be in middle of the teens. If there is advanced glaucoma, that means mean deviation is more than 12 decibels, then we should target a lower teen intraocular pressure. And furthermore, if the patient is having terminal glaucoma, we should have intraocular pressure in single, in single digits. Now, in NDG, we need to further lower down our target intraocular pressure. But this is not the end of the story. There are other important, thing, the important things which we need to consider about our target intraocular pressure. Now, like uh, I said, the patient of advanced glaucoma definitely needs a lower target intraocular pressure. But another thing is life expectancy. If patient has been diagnosed with glaucoma at a younger age, that means he is going to spend ma many more lives here. So there should be a lower target intraocular pressure here. But a patient who has been diagnosed with glaucoma, say at 90 years of age, then he has lesser ears, therefore we can have a, a higher target intraocular pressure in that individual. So age is very very important criteria. Similarly, untreated intraocular pressure. If a patient has been diagnosed glaucoma at lower intraocular pressure, he should have a lower target intraocular pressure. Now, I mentioned about risk factors. If he is having more risk factor, then obviously lower target intraocular pressure. Another important thing is rate of progression. Now, if the patient is having very fast rate of progression, then he should have a lower target intraocular pressure. Now, this is just to show us that how this uh, rate of progression is actually affecting our uh, glaucoma management. Now, a, a line A reflects a normal reduction in a, a visual field with age and it happens with every individual which is around 0.6 decibels per year. Now, there are two subsets of patients. This patient B, which has been diagnosed with glaucoma at a later age, is not going to have severe functional impairment. But another patient who has been diagnosed with similar amount of glaucoma at the early age stage of life, if we don't intervene this particular patient, he will definitely have severe functional impairment. Similarly, another subset of patients, two patients who have been diagnosed with glaucoma at similar age, but if we see the rate of progression is lesser in this T patient, but very fast in this E patient. So if we don't intervene this particular E patient, he is going to become blind very soon in his lifetime. So assessing rate of progression becomes very, very important. And for that, we need trend-based analysis on visual field examination. Now, all the newer machines of visual field, they have trend-based analysis. But for that, we need to have two reliable baseline visual field. And we must be doing at least six visual field in two years. Many a times uh, patients ask how, at, at what duration should we get the visual field examination. If they get three visual field in one year or six visual field in two years duration, then we can detect the progression very comfortably. So in trend based analysis, if we enlarge this particular graph, we see that these two are the baseline visual field and these are subsequent visual fields. And moreover, the regression shows that how much is the progression and how what is the type of progression. So here you can see the rate of progression is also given. So in that case, it will show that what is going to happen in next five years duration and then you can accordingly change the treatment in your patient. So now coming to decision regarding medical therapy, uh, just one slide for this because we understand that most of the time the first line treatment is now prostaglandin analogs because uh, they are now cheaper options also available but in patients who are having 
any additional problem if there is an inflamed eye if there is a eye with cystoid macular edema if we have a post uh, uveitic patient post traumatic patients we definitely will not start prostaglandin analog we have to give them beta blocker as a first choice drug and we know that the prostaglandin analogs they have high systemic safety profile they are effective throughout 24 hours and they reach the uh, they re decrease the intraocular pressure to the maximal level so and one drop a day is very convenient for the patient also now another important thing which we tend to uh, be uh, like confused sometimes that when to go for surgery so because whenever we say that we are going to do glaucoma surgery and that will not improve the vision of the patient also the patient retracts back and definitely goes for a second opinion and that uh, even if vision is not improving why should i go for surgery so in that case there are a uh, when to shift is important whenever there is unacceptable glaucoma progression if the target intraocular pressure is not achieved or there is a poor compliance or adherence or patient is coming from far off place where medications are not available. Now, which surgery to choose is another very important. So, trabeculectomy is the gold standard surgery and no doubt about it. Any type of glaucoma, you go for trabeculectomy surgery. But now because we have tube shunts available and especially they have such good results. So, certain glaucoma, especially like NVGs, inflammatory glaucoma or toys operated trap which has failed. In such a scenario, you must go for tube surgery and they uh, do excellent with uh, shunt surgery. So, in those cases, uh, shunt is uh, indicated. For painful blind eye, we all know cyclodestructive procedures are available. Another thing which uh, confuses us many a time is a patient with PACG and cataract. And uh, we know that uh, uh, the many people, they say that just removing the cataract might cure the condition. And when we see these guidelines from World Glaucoma Congress, they say that in patients with mild to moderate glaucoma, we can go for only cataract surgery and can monitor glaucoma in those patients. But if the patient is advanced glaucoma with cataract, never go for only cataract surgery, go for combined surgery in such individuals. Now last slide, I just wanted to highlight the artificial intelligence in glaucoma and uh, it is coming up where data from thousands of patients are being fed, the visual field data, the optic disc data and they are being collaborated in a way so that the, pe the pe people, the, the, pe uh, the surgeons who are sitting at periphery can diagnose the patients on the basis of this artificial intelligence and we are also doing a project in collaboration with Ames Rishikesh. So the take home message is that despite the current tools and understanding of glaucoma is slightly less than perfect for us, especially in cases of suspect. But what we can do, we can effectively apply them in clinical decision making and preserve the vision of our patients and give them good quality of life. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Of